Here we go. Okay. All right. Good, new, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good, uh, just about noon. Uh, and welcome to our talk today. Uh, we are excited to welcome John Powers, the president and co-founder of Clean Capital, to deliver some remarks. The event is hosted by the Center for Business and the Environment at Yale and the Blueprint for Clean Energy series. Welcome to our online audience streaming through YouTube today. For our guests here during the Q&A portion of this event, please uh, press the button in front of you so that those streaming or watching at home can hear your questions. We are fortunate to have John here today. John's responsibilities at Clean Capital include leading corporate strategy and development, investor relations, and marketing. His passion for clean energy derives from his time served with the US Army in Iraq and the realization that a clean energy economy is vital to protect America's national security interests. After helping revolutionize the US Army's energy program, John was appointed by President Obama to serve as the Federal Chief Sustainability Officer. While in this role, John recognized the need to address the inefficiencies in clean energy finance. John was named to Washington Life's top 25 tech leaders for DC in 2016. Join me in welcoming John here this afternoon. John, we look forward to hearing you sure. and what you have to say. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Just say hi to my dad who's watching online. <laughs> Hoping by the end of this he understands what I do for a living. Uh, thank you to Heather and the folks at the center for uh, being amazing hosts and appreciate the opportunity to do this. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to talk a little bit about clean capital and what we're doing and talk about the way that our world's being completely transformed right now in so many different ways. But I want to talk a little bit about myself and how I got transformed into this space. Um, you know, I started off, uh, as Corey mentioned, I was in the Army. I was, uh, did ROTC when I was in college, joined the military, deployed to Iraq in 2000, uh, 2003 to 2004 over around a 15 month period. We lived in one of Uday Hussein's palaces on the Tigris River, right outside of Baghdad, or in Baghdad, but the northeast side of Baghdad. It was the most hostile sector of Baghdad in 2003 and 2004. We had on our site, we had a group of Iraqis who came to work every day. It's sort of what you did to help empower the local economy. They did a series of odd jobs. But we also had uh, all of our equipment, our fuel trucks, our communications devices. So we knew when they left, during the day, that evening, they left with certain intelligence. And we knew, literally, if they left at 6, by 6.30, wherever our fuel trucks were, we were going to get mortared. So we literally had to move our fuel trucks every day after they left the, the other, a different part of the base. It was my first ever understanding of the concept of energy security. Right? It wasn't until I came home and studied these issues, dove into them both economically or academically and professionally, that I began to understand the ideas behind climate change and climate security and, and renewables. But there are t veterans all across the space today because of their time in Iraq, Afghanistan. They saw this, as, as Alex is in the room to, to hopefully back me up on this, they, they saw this firsthand and they, they got motivated to continue their mission, which I've obviously con continued to do. So this is more because I'm speaking uh, here at Yale. I want to talk for a second about my career. Right? How did I end up? where I am. So there are transformational moments and times you have in your life, right? You being here at Yale, is just, you look back and this will be a transformational experience. For me, spending 15 months in Iraq was a transformational experience. You also have defining moments in your life. So when you look back in your career, and I can pick three or four major decisions that I made that at the time I did not know were major, uh, that end up completely redefining who I am as a person and professionally. Well, what do I mean by that? So as I mentioned, I did ROTC in college. I was actually an elementary education major. Uh, graduated, mind you, this is before 9-11. So we got stationed in Germany. And 9-11, for those of us in the military at the time, completely changed the way we looked at our careers in the military. Deployed to Iraq uh, as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003. Spent 15 months there and came home, got out of the military, and had planned to go be a high school principal. I signed up at the University of Buffalo and was supposed to start in January of I think, 2004, sorry, 2005. And there was a documentary made about the unit I served in Iraq with. And it's called Gunner's Palace. It's the first movie out about the war. 
the filmmaker is a friend of mine, calls me up and says, hey, this is going to premiere at the Toronto Film Festival, which is just north of Buffalo, where I'm from. Uh, come up and see the movie. So me, I have, at this point, no experience in the film industry. And Toronto is the second largest film festival in the world. So we get up there. Because I'm in a documentary, I'm an actor. And I get taken to the Diesel Jean store. I get put in Diesel Jeans to wear the Diesel Jean party that night, where there's vodka running down ice luges and scantily clad people all over the place. And I'm six weeks out of Baghdad. right? I mean, culture shock can't be explained. right? So I got to be on stage after the screening, talk about my experiences, uh, sort of be a panel, a panel speaker. And the film company, who at the time was buying the film there at the, at the film festival, said, hey, we want you to go on a movie tour with us. Uh, and I'm like, sure, call me, call me uh, when you're going to do this. Never thinking they'd call. Flash forward six months, I'd gone and spent some time in China. So it was just sort of did my post-army uh, relief. And I'm ready to start at University of Buffalo. And literally the week before we're supposed to start, I get a phone call from the film company. And they said, hey. We're going on this movie tour. Come with us. The grad school, movie tour, tough decisions. My mom was really pissed that I chose the movie tour, uh, but I did. And I ended up traveling the country. Uh, we did 23 cities or something over six weeks, movie festivals, major military bases. I ended up talking about my experience in ways I never thought I would. I met other soldiers that had similar experiences and met the families of my friends who didn't come home. And about five weeks into this, we were in Phoenix, Arizona. And we're in a local Today show, NBC Today show. And we're in the green room. And I'll swear this is totally true, with Cedric the Entertainer. And at this point, I'm pretty jaded. I've done a gazillion interviews at this point. And afterwards, one of the, the cameramen comes out. And he said, hey, really would like to show you our, our wall of honor here. And I'm like, sure. You know, I figured it was like a, literally a wall. Walks us into a warehouse of eight and a half by 11 pictures of uh, every man and woman who died in Iraq. They were literally in the order that they were killed. We could stand there and tell stories about them, the ones that we knew. And at that point, I'm like, I got to do something different. I can't just go home. I, I didn't know what it was. But I ended up, because of that, launching a nonprofit, going back to Iraq, spending uh, two years trying to keep 16 to 25-year-olds from being recruited in extremist groups, which is a whole other talk at a whole other time. But, um, all because I chose to go on the movie tour. Ended up, because of the lack of leadership I saw in Washington around many things, but obviously the war was a major part of it, decided to run for Congress outside of Buffalo, New York. I had no political bone in my body prior to being deployed to Iraq. And I came home and got active the first time. I didn't really know what that meant, but I uh, got recruited. I was 28 at the time. Didn't know what I was getting into. Another defining or transformational moment of my experience or, Time of my, my career was being spending 18 months campaigning in my hometown, in my home district, meeting folks that empowered me. I ran on a platform of turning the Rust Belt into the Green Belt. Didn't really know what I was talking about, but it was, I really liked the idea of it. And lost. And losing, couldn't, looking back, was the best thing that ever happened to me. I learned so many lessons from it. Being in Congress probably would have sucked for a little while, because all they're doing is voting on health care like 40 times. Every, um, and all you do is raise money. But it made me reset as a person. Decided I want to go in the net. I went back to school to study uh, energy. I uh, went back to Johns Hopkins, focused on energy security. Moved back to Washington. I was running a think tank called the Truman National Security Project while going to school. Launched a program there to focus on climate security. And I was doing a lot of writing on Huffington Post about the national security implications of climate change. Probably three months into this, I get a call from a Senate staffer who worked on the Environment and Public Works Committee. Now, to set the time here, this is during the climate, climate um, bills, what were known as Waxman-Markey, which is a major climate bill uh, that passed in the House, and they were trying to pass it in the Senate. So I ended up testifying. Actually, this picture here is the testimony. The, the man on the left is John Warner, a former senator from Virginia, former Secretary of the Navy, married to Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, fascinating human being, Republican, but really behind climate. The guy next to him is a three-star admiral named Denny McGinn. Me, of course. And then this, this Exxon lawyer. When I got the, the ask to do this, my wife said to me, 
do you have any clue what you're talking about? I'm like, no, but I'm going to do this. And I spent the next two weeks writing a thesis, basically, that became my testimony. So it, was a, it was a major risk. I could completely embarrass myself in retrospect. I don't know why I did it, but it worked out. Warner, who I'd never met before, after the testimony, pulls me aside and says, hey, we really need more Iraq Afghanistan veterans advocating for this stuff. So with his help, we launched an organization called Operation Free, which started to recruit Iraq Afghanistan vets and others over 5,000 around the country advocating for climate change policy and educating others on it. But he also said, listen, I just paid this person to put a $60,000 report together on what the Defense Department should be doing on clean energy. And he sends us a report. My friend Jim Warren and I red penned the report, and we sent it back to him. So I get a call from his secretary. He said, Senator Warner wants to meet with you. Come on over. And got to his office and literally slides this thing back across the table and said, give me a new version by Monday. I'm like, did you just pay somebody $60,000 to write this? Why am I writing this? Uh, but I did. And all of a sudden, Jim and I were published energy security experts for the Defense Department. And we started to speak on it. I began to getting deeper on it. But I also knew that there was a huge opportunity because the Army has three times the square footage of Walmart but had no energy policy. So I got lucky, and the, the Obama administration appointed me as the first special advisor on energy to the Army. And literally, we wrote the policy, which became the energy policy, on a napkin and sort of sketched this out and created it. And then began to implement what really ended up being, I think, a pretty interesting structure that has helped change the way the military has approached this, which includes the, the Army now having a gigawatt renewable energy goal that they're on track to meet doing billions of dollars of energy efficiency projects, having electric vehicles on their bases, piloting microgrids, really game-changing stuff. Not to mention the stuff they're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan for their soldiers, where when a soldier deployed, right, they have all this equipment that had, they needed seven different types of batteries to power. An average weight of a three-day mission for batteries was 30 pounds. They were taking 30 pounds of batteries because they couldn't interchange them or recharge them. So we got them to rethink the way that worked. And for me, what that meant was I was all of a sudden working with these engineers. I was getting deeper on these issues. And I really committed to, to understanding them. How does this stuff work? Why does it work? Where does it work? And they were also doing a lot of public-private partnerships. So we launched this thing called the Energy Initiative Task Force which was doing long-term power purchase agreements as the military with third parties. And we we're doing these interesting concepts. And a guy named Richard Kaufman, who's, I think, known here at Yale, is now in New York, at the time was at the Department of Energy. And Richard would come over to the Pentagon, and he'd sit on the other side of the desk from us, and he'd talk about securitizing our power purchase agreements. And no one knew what he was talking about. But he sounded really smart. So no kidding, I bought corporate finance for dummies, which I still have my bookshelf, and started to read it. So I'm like, I got to understand what this dude's talking about. And two years into this job, we're, being, we're having success. I got to ask him to the White House. I become the president's chief sustainability officer. So now I'm doing the same thing across the rest of the federal fleet, which is significant, right? The federal government has a $4 billion electricity bill. Right? So there's a significant impact you can make. And I'm happy to talk more about that, too. But Richard and I was coming to the White House and having similar conversations with policymakers that are working on things like the Paris negotiations, right? Or energy efficiency or energy star. But people didn't understand what he's talking about in the finance piece. So he and I started a clean energy finance working group so we can better understand it. And when I was transitioning then from my job at the White House, I knew it was a space I wanted to go into. And I transitioned, met my partner, Tom who was the brother-in-law of a guy I served in Iraq with. Tom was working at a private equity firm. We got together, and he said, look, we were lamenting about all these inefficiencies in clean energy finance. And he said, I just refinanced my law school loans on this platform called SoFi.com. How do we do this for clean energy? And so we sort of rolled the dice, spent two years working on our business model, why we had day jobs, and uh, you know, convinced someone to fund us and launch our company. And now we're three years in. Uh, but there were really clear moments that, I, at the time, I made decisions that I didn't know where they were going to lead. I, knew, I sort of understood my risk tolerance, and I was willing to push the boundary a little bit. Uh, in retrospect, it's worked out. <laughs> it might not have worked out. Um, my mom's watching, it's worked out. Mom. 
Um, but you know, as you're thinking through your next steps, sort of post school, first of all, I think you made the right move coming here. You're doing the right homework to figure out your strengths. But as I mentioned earlier, when I met with a group of students, know what you want to get out of this, on the tail end of this, right? You don't know. You have to know where you're going to go because the chances are you'll never figure that out. Just know what you want to get out of school, so that when you walk <laughs> walk out of here, you have a skill set, and know that if you're not position yourself to be a lifelong learner, right? I look, I do stuff every day that I have no right to be doing. I'm trying to figure it out. But that's pretty common you're going to find across all industries. And you want to, you want to pre push yourself, learn those different spaces. And then where you can, you end up become as much of an expert as you can. And you end up speaking at Yale, right? So it's, <laughs> it works out. But you've got to be able to take those risks, understand those risks. And make decisions that you know at the time you don't know they're defining, but when you look back, they end up being that way. So enough about me. I want to talk for a second about not for a second. This is what the talk's going to be about. About <laughs> <laughs> what's happening to our economy. There are major transformations happening to our power sector. To there's a clean energy revolution that's coming together in a way that that couldn't have been imagined 20 years ago. And there's disruption happening in the finance sector as well that are totally changing the world, the way the world's going to bank. It's all, if you put those three circles together, it's all about technology. Technology is empowering these changes. Policy plays a critical role in it as well, but technology enables and empowers it. Clean capital sits in the middle of it. I'll get to that later. But I'm going to start off with the power sector. Okay, so how do we get our power? Right? Mid last century, a group of engineers put together our grid. Right, it's an amazing infrastructure feat. Right, known it's the National Academy of Engineers say it's the top in invention of the 19th century. Somewhere down the road here, there's a generating plant sending electricity through wires. You can power this building. You can plug your phone in. Right, it's incredible. And to be honest, it has not been replicated all over the world. In many places, it has. It's a major infrastructure investment. But there's parts of the world that don't have this type of infrastructure. So how does it work? So in the simplest way, you've got major generating plants. You have over 3,000 utilities managing this, right? Sending powers from those plants to over 5,000 substations that help distribute it locally. Over 5 million miles of distribution wire, right? Powering this system so that we can basically power ourselves in our homes and our businesses powers our economy. It powers sort of every part of our lives, right? So what's happening to this sector? This is a great 20th century structure that's being disrupted now in the 21st century. Why is it being disrupted? A few, few reasons, right? There are risks to the centralized grid. So in 2003, in Northeast Ohio, a sagging set of wires hit a tree. Set up a chain reaction that, because of some software glitches, knocked out power for over 50 million people for four days. I'm going to look at my notes so I get the number right, but it caused between four to ten billion dollars of the economic damage, right? When the, the grid went down. So, cyber is something a lot of people talk about. 2015 in Ukraine, the Russians took down their Ukrainian power grid. Many people see it as a straw man attack, to prepare for future other attacks. Completely knocked out the grid, causing significant economic damage. Department of Homeland Security and others have put out a study that said that a cyber attack in our grid could cause upwards of $243 billion worth of damage right, by taking out our grid. And our utilities are far from prepared for this. There's the human threat. In 2015, it's just south of San Jose, which is where Silicon, just north of Silicon Valley, or south of Silicon Valley. Seven gunmen got out of their car took shots at 17 different parts of a utility structure, caused $15 million worth of damage, and took out part of the grid. They've not been caught. The only reason we know this is because one of the former chairman of FERC told this to the Washington Post, or I'm sorry, Wall Street Journal, and it became unclassified. Uh, but is a true threat. And again, another possible straw man situation, right? And of course, natural disasters, right? Superstorm Sandy alone. Caused over 15, I'm sorry, 50 billion dollars in economic damage. So people recognize these threats exist. They 
Corporate America is recognizing that they've got to empower themselves locally as much as possible to be able to do their operations. Why? This happens in New York City in Hurricane Sandy, right? Huge parts of the grid knocked out. The, the, the previous solution to this was I was going to have a diesel generator at my facility many times in the basement, right? So what happens? One, it floods. Diesel generator is knocked out. And this is a case study for multiple facilities in New York City, right, including hospitals. Number two, who gets the diesel generator when there's million or diesel when there's millions of people without power, right? So Hurricane Sandy, you had the military literally managing logistics, first responders, hospitals. There's a case study of a biotech company in San Diego when there was a major power outage there. It was relying on uh, diesel generators. All of their uh, not their IP, all of their stock was people's DNA frozen in these freezers, right? So they came within hours of running out of diesel fuel, which would have taken, taken their entire company out because they were relying on that diesel generators. And they realized they needed to solve a better way. And companies have recognized this. Walmart lost millions of dollars in frozen pizza, right, and other goods during Hurricane Sandy. FedEx lost the ability to do distribution, right, at some of their warehouses. Hospitals, uh, other, Wall Street had trouble operating, right? Think about all the electronic trades that we do during these times. So folks have been starting to focus on the idea of a distributed grid, right? Why, why can we do distributed grid now that we couldn't do it 10 years ago? Because of technology improvements. Things like solar at, at the localized level, fuel cells, which can power sort of 24-7 on site, the idea of microgrids, which I'll talk about in a second, software to move that electricity around, those electrons around. Those are here in new ways. Companies like Google, eBay, powering their data centers this way. The Pentagon is doing all sorts of microgrid pilots, trying to find ways to have on-site secure power. Walmart as is, is, is well. Now, this isn't all just great news, right? Because what does this mean to the utility business model? Right, going back to one on one, we produce power, we sell it to the end user. Right, all of a sudden, these folks are producing their own power. Right, uh, the MGM completely took themselves off the grid in Nevada. Basically, they paid eighty-two million dollars to, to buy their own power as a penalty, as a penalty to be able to buy their own power because they wanted to get themselves away from the utility. What does that do? That local utility business model. So these disruptions are happening. They're, they're happening in a very transformative way. It's not going to happen overnight. There's a blend of policy, technology, costs that are all sort of coming together here. So I'm going to talk for a second about microgrids. Uh, this is a project just up the street in Hartford. So between leaving the White House and launching Clean Capital, I was at a company called Bloom Energy and oversaw the public sector business development. And this is a project that we did. I won't go into the technical side of it. But in short, what this, pot, what this did is put fuel, site, fuel cells on site at a community center and a school that, when running normally and the grid is working, is powering the school. Right? When the grid goes down, it can then power, through a microgrid, a gas station and a grocery store and a community center. So think about that. You've got an islandable part of the community that has gas running, groceries, and a community center where people can go and plug in their phone, for instance. Right? So this was able to be executed because the state of Connecticut recognized post-Hurricane Sandy they needed to do something. They launched a series of microgrid pilots. This is one of those pilots. And this was, I don't want to go into the business model of this, but this is a way that you're seeing more and more change happening at a localized level. One of the hardest stakeholders to engage in this whole process was the utility. Right, who was being told by the state to do this. But once they came on board, they become a good partner. And a lot of those changes are happening now because they're being forced to the table, but they're willing to make those changes. What does this mean to your house? Everyone here is a Tesla. People think about Tesla, they think about the cool car. Right? Tesla's way more than a car company. So these, this house has solar-powered uh, roof tiles right, being produced in my great hometown of Buffalo, New York. They power a battery that's in the garage. So people don't live at home during the day mostly, right? They're out at work. Being captured in the, and that can use to charge the car or even charge the house at night, right? Creating a almost centralized distributed power system in the residential home. 
Not every house can do this, of course. Right? If you've got trees over your house, it's not going to work. But there's a lot of houses started, starting to do this. And the reality is, this is a, a direct attack on a consumer for the utility industry, right? So how do we figure out policy mechanisms to empower those utilities to be part of this business conversation? And that's happening all over the country, uh, differently, unfortunately. So I'm going to take it completely out of energy for a second and talk about telecom industry and how these, how these connect. So think about the way, you know, back in the early 1900s, every street had a phone. Every street had a phone, right? Not every house. And every house had a phone. That phone ran through wires, and then you connected to the person on the other side. Right? In the mid-'90s, there was something called the Federal Telecommunications Act that broke up these massive utilities called Ma Bells. Right? When the Ma Bells broke up, all of a sudden, innovation started to happen. You began to get distributed cell phone towers, right? no longer connected through wires. And it drove us today to the innovations that we carry around in our pocket, right? only really in the last 20 years because of that innovation, because we went to a distributed system. So this is the future. This is Apple Park, Steve Jobs' last vision. Um, it is 175-acre headquarters that Apple just finished uh, in California. It's powered 100% by renewable energy, solar, fuel cell, wind. It completely microgrids itself from the utilities. And it's where many businesses and corporations are starting to head in their structure. Now, needless to say, this is a challenge to the local utility, right, who's not going to be selling power day to day to them, but has to have the ability to back that up, right? So there's so many implications on a policy and business perspective to wrestle on, but the demand is happening, right? This isn't the future, this is happening today. This disruption is happening today. So what does it mean outside of those trying to make money and those here in the US, right? So if you look at, this is a picture of the world at night. Right now in, in Africa, you've got a quarter of the, well, first of all, a quarter of the world's population is without power, right? In Africa, only two in five people have access to reliable power. Only two in five people have access, right? And they don't have the capability to put in billions of dollars in infrastructure to build that grid. But now you can have distributed generation systems putting power on site. You can have solar powered water filtration systems, right? That may be able to power uh, a, a cell phone tower, right? to provide them connections to the world, maybe be able to power, or literally plug their cell phone into the generator. Distributed generation systems that will change the way that folks all over the world are, are receiving their power. I think it's a really exciting time for the space. We're in this really transformational time for the industry that continues to struggle literally you know, year by year on how this is going to happen, but the trend is very clear. It's happening. So let's step back out of the pure power sector and let's talk about clean energy for a second. So why today is the clean energy revolution happening? 30 years ago, Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House. 30 years ago. This is the year I was born, 1978. So 40 years ago, actually. God, I'm old. Um, <laughs> 40 years ago. So the technology was there, right? The technology existed. It got taken down in the early 80s more for political reasons than anything else, right? So why is it 40 years now that solar is all of a sudden coming around? One of the things I got to do at the White House, which was fascinating, was be in the team that put solar panels back on the White House. Right? It was a, it was a, a lot of work, as Franz can probably tell you, that things don't change easily there. But we got it done, uh, and they're still there today. But it's not just in the White House. They're happening, it's happening all over the country. Why? We've, we came to an interesting mix of policy, costs, and technology. Right. So this is a picture of the cost of solar panels per watt and what happened with installations. Right. And I'll come back to the cost in a second. But in 2006, George Bush passed the Energy Security Act. And the Energy Security Act had very key policy drivers, the investment tax credit for solar, the wind tax credit, and some others as well. Those tax credits helped to trigger some of this growth. Then 2008, the economy crashes. A bunch of money got put into rebuilding this country from an infrastructure perspective from our government. 
He went to shovel ready projects. Well, a lot of those were clean energy projects, right? So all of a sudden, installation started to happen, right? At a, probably more co higher cost than they would have if that, hadn't, that trigger hadn't been pushed. That drove efficiency across the industry, right? Efficiency of folks who now know how to install these, how to maintain them, how to manage them. Not to, at the same time, panel manufacturing is starting to boom, bringing down the costs overall to those panels. So that mix crossed, you know, in sort of 2005, 2006, as installations started to rise. And that cost continues to come down. There are challenges to it, like, like, like uh, President Trump's recent solar tariff, right? But looking back, that will be a speed bump in the macro trends of this industry. The growth is happening in all across clean energy because the technology is here, the policy drivers are right, state level policies like RPSs are in place, utilities have been forced to the table, and installations continue to grow. How much do they grow? They grow to the point that next year, it's predicting that renewable energy will surpass nuclear, the amount of power it's putting on the grid, right? People th said that would never happen. It's happening, and it's not only happening in an in a exciting way, it's happening in a way that it's, we see sort of astronomical growth going forward, meaning that renewable energy is no longer an alternative energy. It is a mainstream energy, right? And we have to start treating it like a mainstream energy as advocates, as business leaders, and others. So I had a, somebody on my podcast recently, been around the industry for a long time. He said the biggest dramatic, dramatic shift for him was when he went to the Solar Power International Conference and he saw a lot less male ponytails, a lot more people in suits. Mm -hmm. And he went from this industry of you know, sort of cowboys to folks that are taking it from the economic impact. And that economic impact is real, and I'll talk about that more in a second. So, this is from a, uh, a great report that just came out from the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. They put out an annual Sustainable Energy in America fact book, backed by the Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, but the number on here that I love is 471% growth since 2008 in renewable energy generation. 471%. That's in incredible. So it's not just the technology's there. It's not just the policies there. You have major corporations committing to this, right? So 60% uh, of Fortune 100s have renewable energy goals. 53 companies have 100% uh, renewable energy goals, meaning 100% of their operations. Google's already been there. Apple's closing in. Walmart's on track, right? These are astronomical numbers they're putting forward. But they're not just doing it because they want to be green. In 2016 alone, Folks saved over $3.7 billion on their electricity bills by going with renewable energy. $3.7 billion, right? So that's a, that turns it from a chief sustainability officer decision in the corporation to a CFO decision in the corporation, right? And that's awesome. Like, that's game changing. And that's where, that means it's here to stay. And we've also seen tremendous growth in the investment in this, right? So last year alone, uh, world energy investment total, 335, I'm sorry, $333.5 billion. Since 2010, there's been $2.5 trillion in cumulative clean energy investing. It grows. So, so what is it, why does it matter that it grows? Not just that more money's coming in. Different money's coming in. More cost-effective money's coming in, right? So think about solar energy in 2008. You're building a, you're building a facility in New Jersey. People don't know if these panels are going to work. They don't know how long they're going to work. They don't know if people know how to maintain them. They don't know if the sun shines enough in New Jersey to have solar power, right? So that's a risky bet. So you've got private equity firms with high cost of capital willing to take that risk and take that bet, right? Now, flash forward 10 years. Panels are working. Systems are great. Huge companies are committing to these long-term. No one knew what a PPA was in 2008, power purchase agreement. Raise your hand if you know what a power purchase agreement is. All right, good. I don't need to explain it. So, Long-term power purchase agreements are in place. Companies see the benefits, and they're committing to it. Now, more institutional capital can start to come in. Pension funds, insurance companies, banks, meaning more aggressive bids, better capital, cheaper cost of capital. And I'll talk more about why that matters here in a little bit. And then finally, jobs. Last year, the number one job in the world, the number two job, or sorry, number one and two in the country, were uh, wind technician, 
in solar panel installation in terms of growth. 250,000 jobs in solar today. That's, over, that's more than all fossil fuels combined, right? Amazing. And these aren't jobs in Manhattan, right? These are people in Iowa working on wind farms. These are people in Arizona installing wind panels, right? These are real jobs across the country. And the industry is starting to stand up and address, I think, this in a new way, which is exciting. This is the way we should be talking about it. This is sort of growth in jobs overall. Uh, again, from, from, this is from Department of Energy. Another sector that doesn't get talked about enough in clean energy is energy efficiency. Uh, it's a, playing a major role, and, and the growth is significant. So the final thing I want to talk about before bringing this all together is what's happening in fin fintech, financial technology, or the finance sector. It used to be if you wanted to start a business, you went to your local branch, you opened up a bank account, you got a loan, you had to go get credit cards from someone else, right? Now that's totally being disrupted. Things like crowdfunding, you've got mobile payments, money transfer payments. They're, they're happening in ways that technology is sort of booming the industry. This year, last year alone, 26, there are 26 FinTech companies, they were unicorns, with the valuation of over $83 billion, right? Companies like SoFi, PayPal, which we've all heard of, right? These are financial technology companies, right? They're changing the way uh, finance is here. So what's going to continue to grow in this space? There's been a 600% increase of VC, venture capital money, into FinTech in the last four years, right? 600% increase. So you're going to only continue to see disruption happening across the sector. I'm not going to go through what each of these folks do, because I'm going to tie this to clean energy. But I do want to talk about why this matters to the world, right? Three quarters of the world's poor are unbanked, right? And they, they don't have bank accounts. Why don't they have bank accounts? Many of them live too far from being able to walk to a local branch. Right? They don't have credit to open up an account. Many of them don't have the money to open up an account. But now, think about this. You've got localized power powering a cell phone, allowing them to get a telephone, a cell phone, right? They don't need the infrastructure, telecom infrastructure. So whole parts of the third world are leapfrogging the telecom industry right, and getting the cell phones. Now they can actually do over 600 types of payments through text messages, right? So mobile service providers in places like Sub-Saharan Africa aren't just selling you cell phone minutes. They're giving you banking services, right? So you can get your paycheck or pay for services, pay your bills literally through text messages, right? And what it's doing is it's helping create sort of financial inclusion in a new way. You've got over a billion people today using online banking services in, in a new way. But why does this matter for clean energy, right? 64% of a clean energy project are what's known as soft costs, right? That could be permitting fees. That could be uh, customer acquisition fees. But the reality is there's a lot to squeeze there, right? And as we, the more we can squeeze and bring efficiency, the cheaper these projects are going to be, the more we're going to get them on, the, on the, the grid, right? So a good example, transaction costs, right? A lot of that are legal bills. Any lawyers in the room? All right, good. They're super expensive, and you need it for everything, and they cost a lot of money, right? They're completely inefficient. So if you can bring efficiency to these deals and bring pre-cooked packages to them, it brings efficiency and cuts down those costs. So what are we doing at Clean Capital to do that? Right, at Clean Capital, we consider ourselves a fintech company in clean energy. We are using our platform to identify, screen, and manage projects on behalf of investors, right? So we identify projects. We are acquiring them through, through traditional acquisition, but we're using our platform. Our platform is built to help us acquire in a very efficient way and package these to investors in a brand new way, right? So traditional investors uh, in the space, but also we want to go after new investors who may have wanted to get into clean energy, but have yet to sort of enter. So if we can put very investable portfolios together for them uh, through our technology, we can start to drive. So we, our goal is to make investing clean and simple. Right? I'm happy to go deep into the clean energy, clean capital piece of this, but I don't want to completely oversell us. We're working all over the country today acquiring projects.
in our first year alone, we did around $20 million in deals. Last year, we did close to 40. We expect to do close to 50 in Q1, right? We're growing. We have capital. We're buying projects. We're acquiring them. We are working in an underserved market, the commercial industrial space. So you've got a lot of folks will battle over utility scale solar because it's just as hard to do a $5 million deal as a $50 million deal, right? And banks want to do 150, not 10 fives. And residential looks a lot like home loans. So a lot of people sort of battle there. Commercial industrial is a hard area, right? So we use technology to, to try to bring synergies in those deals that we're presenting to our investors. So why is it attractive to them? Because especially in an unstable market, these returns are very good. To give you a sense, renewable energy investments are expected to climb to 11 trillion by 2040. City in 2007 committed 50 billion over 10 years, met that goal three years early, and have now committed $100 billion. Bank of America has a $125 billion commitment by 2025. JP Morgan, $200 billion by 2025. This is real money moving into the sector efficient money that will continue to drive down the cost of these projects and increase the adoption of clean energy, which is what we're heading towards. You can learn more about our story at cleancapital.com. And with that, I'll open to questions. <laughs> Sir. Are you buying the assets, or are you buying the output, or are you leasing long term? Yeah. What is your optimal? What, how are you going about it? So let, we'll start off with our, the way we started our company, right? We looked at where in the market, if our goal is to bring more capital to the space, where in the market will have the biggest effect, right? There's still early development stuff that's going on. There's still capital going there. At the time, we were starting yield codes were functioning, right? And they were beginning to eat up all the utility scale solar. A Yoko basically buys an existing project, right? So there's a 20 year PPA with Walmart. They would buy 20 year PPA with their utility. They come in at year six and buy out the next 15 years, right? We were doing the same thing at CNI. So we saw CNI as an open opportunity and started to reach into that market, which because Yokos weren't touching them. So we're buying up those operating solar assets that have 15 years left on a power purchase agreement and bundling them for long-term investors that want that, reg you know, they're, they don't, they're not looking for the higher double-digit returns that private equity is. They're looking for a long-term cash flow. That's our, we joke internally, that's our gateway drug, right? If we can get folks into that, that's a really easy to understand real estate-esque type of deal. We are completely acquiring that project from the owner. And then we bring them and put them in a investable portfolios, right? We have dedicated capital that's allowing us to, if we see one deal, we could buy it. If we see a $15 million portfolio, we could buy it. Um, so we're, we're and then bundling them to a larger portfolio for larger institutions in the future, and hopefully someday securitizing. That's that's. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, <laughs> does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. And we do, by the way, this year for the first time we have dedicated tax equity, so we'll start to move earlier in the development chain. We're determining that now. Um, Making enough profits today, someone else could own for tax purposes and lease it to you. Yeah. You could buy it at the back end. Uh, That's right. So you could use that as a leverage. And a lot, of, if you think about the original investors, right, there are a lot of private equity who have funds that end at a certain year. So there'll be a lot of flipping that has to happen. As well as when these things use this investment tax credit, you can't sell a project you own with the investment tax credit for five years or the IRS, has, well, you're at risk to get that clawed back. So we can come in at year six and buy it. Those, er, those early developers have no interest in 20 years of cash flow. They want to buy, build a house, flip the house, build a house, flip the house. So we're going to help them flip. So there's, there's a ton of it out there. So, and more to come, hopefully. Hi. Um, you mentioned Clean Capital as a platform. So yeah. um, I was wondering if you can explain that more and kind of explain the fintech part of the company. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? So, we're in clean energy, right? Um, we are a financial technology. So our platform isn't about, so you think about clean tech, you think about technologies that are in clean energy, right? Um, you think about fuel cells, solar, wind, 
uh, software for energy management, right? We, we would love to say we're a clean tech company. What we really are is a financial technology company that's helping to underwrite these. Our, our technology helps us underwrite and manage the deals in a very efficient way, driving down those costs of acquisition, those costs of management. So we can do a $5 million deal as well as a $50 million deal. Clean tech, first of all, because of what happened sort of in the early VC days of clean tech, has a little bit of a, a, a negative connotation in the space. right? A lot of folks lost their their pants in clean tech. The reason they did is because clean tech takes a long time. right? New technologies and clean energy take years or sometimes decades because the regulatory structures. You have people trying to address that on the venture capital side. Folks like Bill Gates have launched a Breakthrough Ventures, which is long-term money. They're trying to get companies like Bloom Energy and others long-term ramps. So that's a whole different conversation. For clean energy, for what we do, is we are working on acquiring clean energy projects. Right? It just happens that we have a technology platform that helps us underwrite them. We're not selling the services. We're not like, letting someone else use our platform. What we do is we go to an investor and say, look, we'll bring you a bunch of deals that look like this. We'll originate them, we'll underwrite them, and we'll have them ready for you to invest in, as long as you dedicate that money. And we have that dedicated money. If you, look at, if you look at the mortgage industry, it's very similar, right? SoFi does this for home loans. Being students, I bet all of you guys get advertisements from SoFi to, re, to, to do your, your student loans, right? They're basically underwriting student loans and turning around to big corporate investors or industrial investors to invest in it. Sorry, someone else had their hand up. Yeah. yeah I was um, hoping to hear you chat about exposure toward energy assets sort of the, at the local state legislature level versus the national level, yeah. and how do you think about building out a balanced portfolio from a, a risk management standpoint? It's a great question. Um, first of all, the, the reason I'm excited about this space in the face of some of the federal headwinds you may hear, hear from the Trump administration is because of what's happening at the state and local level. This has become a state and local fight, right? So these are you, you can look at some of the states that we're in, right, and see these are some of the early adopters of clean energy policy, right? Because we're buying older projects, right? We're buying projects that were built maybe five or six years ago. So the RPS is in place or net metering in place, right? Now it's a much broader playing field for us, which is great as, as states have gotten more and more aggressive with this. Um, what I'm excited about is the states that com have committed to this space aren't changing. Like California is not going to all of a sudden turn around and be like, ah, oh, we're done. Thank you. Nevada? The there's a big fight in Nevada about net metering, right? That's a huge issue. For commercial and industrial, not as much. It is for residential solar. Right? So we have to really closely monitor and track the policy implications of what we do and bring those risks into our investments. SREX is another good example. These solar, everyone know what an SREC is? Right? Basically, the credits developed by these projects. They're, understand their SREC market is a complete industry in its own, right? So how do you then risk that into a deal, right? Or try to sell those out? So we, we have to understand all those policy implications. But I'm excited about clean energy because it doesn't matter what, I mean, it doesn't matter what the Trump administration does for sure, but um, this is where the fight continues to be at. And I think it, the, the best thing that's going to happen here is there are so many local jobs being created by these industries that folks are going to really be handcuffed to, to, to cut them off. Hi. Um, could you describe your approach to lead generation? And then could yeah. you also talk a little bit about the software that your company is based on? Like, is it screening um, potential deals for certain terms and conditions, and that's how you're reducing your soft costs, or is it some other method? Sure. So without giving away too much secret sauce on how we do our, our work, um, lead generation is critical for us, right? We have to have a big enough origination engine that investors want to come to the table with us, right? And we've proven ourselves in that space. This is why we have you know, our first investors included John Hancock, the life insurance company. We are yet to announce a major fund we just closed because they see that. And it's a multiple prong approach. It involves traditional origination of uh, engaging. We actually have a list of every project in the country and who owns it, and we literally engage them. We have online targeted social media efforts. Um, and as those projects come in, we can screen them Right? And we have certain tools that help us do that. We have certain people that are actually in the room today that help us do this. Emily and Zoe, raise your hands. <laughs> and others. Uh, so it's a mix of technology and human, right? So say, a, uh, say there's 150 points in a due diligence on a project. 
Right? We'll probably never get 149 of those technology. But with each iteration of our platform, if we can cut off 10 of them, right? We can continue to drive more efficiency. So we'll, one of the best pieces of advice we got as a startup was really early, where we had this great vision of what we we're going to do, and we wanted to build this platform. We we're going to raise money to do it, and someone said, "Don't. Go do some deals, and build a platform that supports what you're doing. If you try to build a perfect thing, you're going to find out it's not what you needed, and that's completely true because our business plan has changed over time and continues to change, and our mindset is about executing." So how do we enable ourselves to execute with that technology? And there's, it's not something we'll like lay, we're gonna lay out like our platform to folks. We, if you, like people get access to our platform through the deals, and they, we want them to fall in and sort of see what we're doing, feel comfortable in that, what our underwriting is. Other questions? Any online, was there an online piece of this thing? Um, well, they asked, can you name some FinTech companies serving the US residential market? Mm. Sunrun, I think, technically, I was really, I don't know if you'd call it a fintech company. Um, Clean Power Finance, or now Spruce Energy is doing residential energy efficiency and, and solar. Uh, Mosaic is a really cool company. Mosaic, we originally started as a crowdfunding company. That was our original vision. And we have, we will go back to that someday. But what we learned, some of our, so what, going back to your clean tech question, whoever asked it. Um, when we started to do our Series A, which allowed us to grow, we went out to clean tech investors, clean energy investors, and they were really focused on the crowdfunding. Crowdfund democratize this. This is cool. And we like that idea. We, want to, we do want to change the world. But unless you have an origination engine that manages and brings enough deals to do, you're spending all your time finding investors, not finding deals. And so we actually changed our investor base and had a bunch of financial technology investors, including the Chief Investment Officer of Lending Club joined our board. Right, he has a great experience with this. Brought things to our, us in terms of corporate lessons that allowed us to leapfrog changes that would have taken us a year to figure out right, and change our approach. Um, we haven't entered the, the we, we watched Mosaic. Wonder Capital is another one that's doing commercial industrial loans that are doing interesting stuff. Um, so we watch all these folks really closely and try to learn from them. For life of the assets, uh, yeah. considerations for obsolescence, disruption, um, yeah. considerations for retrofitting and extending the life. Are you, are you thinking about this? It's great. It's, it's the most exciting thing about what we do, I think, besides buying projects, is, and Zoe here helps me lead this for our team. We think a lot about optimizing our assets, right? So we buy a project from a state school in Colorado, right? They love it. It's going great. The panels don't shut down at year 20, right? So can we ex extend that power purchase agreement with them, which is all revenue back to our investors? Can we expand that? They got another 15 acres there. Can we do, the, do it on site? Or can we bring battery storage into that project, right? Is there, you know, there's discussions of uh, technologies like there, there, uh, we know of a company that's working on a paint, the paint over the panels to increase their efficiency. Like that's, it would be awesome if we can do that stuff. And we outsource a lot of our asset management to some real true professionals in that space and work closely with them to track what's happening. And then what we, I think what our value is, is our customer relations. Where a lot of private equity firms will own these things and never call the energy manager at the elementary school, right? We call them quarterly or biannually. We're constantly sending them information. And we're touching them in a way that I think they feel comfortable with us, and when we go back to have a conversation, it's, okay, we have this more opportunity to do with you. So, which is not easy, but it's, actually, it's a fun part of the job. I'm curious about your thoughts about employment of veterans in renewable energy yeah. efficiency. Great question. As a veteran, I think it's an amazing space. Um, it's the Solar Energy Foundation has put out some really great research on veterans in the market, and it's, uh, it's, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's pretty significant. Um, it's a space that a lot of folks are powered by the mission, right? And then that, whether it be on the finance side of things or the installation side or the energy management side, a lot of the skill set that they've learned in the military comes along with them. Um, so I think it's a really exciting space for them. And more. I think you're seeing more and more vets enter it. And there's good efforts, like the Solar Foundation, 
Uh, Department of Energy launched something called Solar Powered Bets, where they were going on a basis. And when you leave the military, you, you transition, right? So you've got a couple weeks worth of classes that helps you take your resume and stop talking about being a battalion commander with an artillery unit that no one understands what that means. It says, I managed you know, 200 people and $50 billion worth of industry. You know, it helps you translate your skill set. And they literally were doing solar training for them through that program. Um, currently, I think the administration has fought uh, that program, but it's doing great work, and more and more vets are getting involved in the space. Yeah. So I was wondering if the administration strongly affected the way clean capital operates. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, it was a little bit before. It was like a year. Of, we actually started the idea like three years before that. Um, we got financed and started the company in 2015. Um, not going to hide my politics. I was incredibly shocked by what happened in the administration. And uh, was, but was on a plane the day after the election, because we had this previously tran trip, planned trip to Silicon Valley. Uh, to meet with some investors, and was really enlightening when I got out there because I was basically like crying the whole way out there. And <laughs> not really, but basically. Um, I got out there and they started talking about actually the opportunities that are going to happen because of financial deregulation and some of these other things and thought, okay, so what does this mean for our space? So I'm less concerned about the actions they're going to take. I always concerned about when they put in folks like Scott Pruitt, the head of the EPA, who is a uh, very um, keen operator and can do things that are really damaging to our environment. Uh, but there are not that many Scott Pruitts in the administration. They're having trouble finding good people. And what I learned working in government, uh, so we put out an executive order charging the federal government to do a certain set of things for energy. And before I launched that, I'd spent a lot of time with the Pentagon and I had a very you know, 35 year career bureaucrat who when I was a new appointee said to him, hey, this presidential memorandum says we gotta do so much renewable energy. And he said, or what? Or am I gonna go to jail? No. So how are you gonna get me to do it? And it wasn't, he wasn't being a jerk, he was challenging me, right? And so it made me think about when I was putting these type of mandates forward, how did you do it in a way that empowered those folks to want to do this, right, and drive them and motivate them? And so we built those type of, this administration has not done that. They've just pounded out executive orders, which mean nothing if you don't manage them. And they're managing their way out of uh, what's going on in the Russian investigation, not what's going on in clean energy. You saw this with the recent FERC ruling on uh, coal plants, right? Amazing institutional support that an independent organization like FERC could say, no, sorry, sector of energy, that's a really stupid plan. And it was. Just announced today, the guy that wrote that plan just left the Department of Energy, right? He didn't have the bandwidth or the fortitude to try to stick around and, and fight to do what he wanted to do. You, you don't just do this by writing an, an executive order. You gotta fight to make those changes, and a lot of those folks aren't willing to fight. And we gotta fight them back, by the way. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Bye online. It's a good question, though.